Joshua Bell stepped out and took his place beside the garbage pail against the wall. And he was outside the uh, subway station, and uh, he just looked like an ordinary guy. Nondescript, wearing jeans, long sleeve t-shirt, and a Washington Nationals baseball cap. And he picked up his violin, from, took it from the case, he put the case at his feet, put a few dollars of some seed money in there, and began to play. And he did. He played for 45 minutes in Washington, D.C. He played Mozart and Schubert, and over a thousand people streamed by, most of them hardly taking notice at all. But here's what they would have seen if they had really paid attention to him. They would have recognized him as the world-renowned violinist that he was. They would have even taken notice of the violin that he took from the case, a Stradivarius worth $3 million. If they had known uh, that this was arranged by the Washington Post as a social experiment to see uh, basically if people's context, perception, and priorities, and just, you know, if, if, just to see what happens. What, take, what happens if you take a world-famous violinist and this invaluable instrument and in a banal setting at an inconvenient time, would beauty actually transcend? Well, he managed to collect a sum of, wait for it, $32 while performing for 90 minutes at the subway station. The number of people who actually paused and paid attention to him was 27. I think only one person actually recognized him. If they had gone a couple nights earlier to his previous concert with the Boston Symphony, then they would have realized that tickets were sold out at $100 a pop. They missed what was right in front of them. I feel like the same with the book in front of us today. We're going to be looking at Joshua. It's one of those books where we, as I said in the prayer, we're familiar with only parts of it. I don't want us to miss tonight what's right in front of us. I don't want us to miss what we usually ignore in our race through the Bible because parts of Joshua really are, to us, kind of boring. And yet it's just as if we're passing by this amazing musician playing this amazing instrument. I don't want us to miss what's in front of us because there's a message here that we can't afford to ignore. And so we're going through the whole Bible this year. Uh, I want to congratulate you, those of you who are, even if you're behind, I want to congratulate you that are reading and uh, even if you're feeling like, man, I'm not keeping up, this is good. I'm loving this. And we need to pat ourselves on the back. Uh, thank you, Godfrey, for last week taking us through Deuteronomy. We've just finished the first five books of the Bible. And that's a major accomplishment. These are the foundational books. They're called the Pentateuch, the Torah. These are the foundation for everything that follows. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, I have, of walking into the movie 15 minutes late. Have you ever had that experience? And no matter how much you pay attention, no matter how much you piece together the pieces of the plot, you feel like you've missed something because you missed the first 15 minutes. And I often feel like if I've done that, like I may as well just skip it and come back again and watch right from the beginning because it's almost impossible to get the full effect of the movie unless you watch right from the start. And that's exactly what we're seeing in the Bible here. It's impossible, you can master uh, the Gospels and New Testament, but you can even master the Old Testament, but unless you understand the Pentateuch. Unless you understand the first five books of the Bible, it's foundational for everything else. You can't really get the rest of the story. And so it, let me just see if I can summarize it. Every week I think like, man, we're summarizing it again. Uh, I don't want to get boring, repetitive. I mean, here it is. God created the world and made it good. This is a good world. We ruined it through sin. That's why we have attacks and violence and cancer and illness and death and conflict and uh, hard work, like thorns and thistles. That's why things fall apart. That's why our cars break down. Like sin just unleashed, unleashed destruction in the world, devastation in the world. But God made a covenant with his people. He picked a, a pagan a God worshiper, idol worshiper named Abraham, said, you're it. I'm going to pick you through the world. I'm going to bless you. You're going to worship me. Go to Canaan. And God made these promises, I'm going to save the world through you. And he did everything for them. Uh, he grew uh, Abraham into a mighty nation. He rescued them from slavery, gave them his law, and lived among them. 
And uh, even despite their sin, he said, I'm working with you. And that's what we've seen so far. I mean, that's a Cliff's Notes, Cole's Notes version of uh, the Pentateuch. And it's incredible. I mean, this is, just helps us understand God. It helps us understand the world. Helps us understand ourselves. Helps us understand the story of which we're a part. Friends, this is our story. This is the story of which you are a part. This, it began in Genesis 1, and the Pentateuch is just the beginning, and you're part of the story. That's why it's so crucial we understand this, because this, is, like, this helps you understand your life and what's going on in the world around us. And somebody said, understanding these first five books means that we get to actually arrive in time in the movie, and now that we're like a, a couple hours into the movie, you know, we're playing a role who knows how much longer is in the movie. It could be like Dances with Wolves that goes on way too long. But, you know, we're in the middle of the movie, and we get to understand our part in the story of God's mighty act of redemption. And so today we turn a corner. We're out of the Pentateuch, which is the first major section. And we're now into the historic books. Uh, in the Hebrew scriptures, they call these the former prophets. Joshua judges... 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. Now, these are, by the way, prophets. Um, this isn't just history. It is history. As we read it, it's history, but it's history with an agenda. So the authors aren't just saying, you know, here's what happened. Like, I mean, all history is like this, right? It's communicating a message. And the biblical authors actually have an agenda. They're recording what happened, but they're actually communicating a theological perspective. They're giving commentary on this story. And so I have a slide there, uh, Steffi, if you could put it on. Let me just give you a bird's eye view of Joshua. So we're doing all of Joshua today. Joshua is incredibly simple. So let me give it to you. Uh, there's a lot there. You can, I hope as you read it this week, if you're following the plan, that you really enjoy it. But here's what Joshua is about. So chapters 1 to 5, Israel enters the promised land under new leadership. Moses is gone. Joshua is there. Uh, Joshua 1, this is the part we like, be strong and courageous. Uh, you can do it. And everyone likes that, right? Like, woo! Like, yes, be strong and courageous, I can do it. Uh, Joshua 1 to 5 is uh, a picture of this. They're going into the land, and they have to conquer it. They're terrified. They've been 40 years in the wilderness. They've never, they don't know what it's like to conquer a land and take it. So chapters 1 to 5, they go over under new leadership. The key term that happens over and over again, they go over the Jordan River, they enter Israel, uh, Canaan, which becomes Israel. Chapters one to five are just about them going over. Chapters five to 12, they then conquer the land in two military campaigns. So Canaan in those days was a collection of city-states. Uh, it wasn't like a, a cohesive country. It was like a whole bunch of city-states and so in two military campaigns, they take the land. And so chapters 5 to 12 are kind of the exciting part, the battles. They take the land. Chapters 13 to 21 are where we get bored. Chapters 13 to 21 are a list of cities. And here it's like this tribe takes this land, this tribe takes this land. They divide the land. The key word there is divide. In chapters 22 to 24, they recommit to serving the Lord and the key word there is worship. So here's Joshua in a nutshell. They go over to the land that God has promised. They take the land. They divide the land. Can you see why? I mean, the battles are kind of exciting. But can you see why like, people love Joshua 1, be strong and courageous? But then when you get to the list of cities, of you take this city, you take this city, you divide it up, people are like, I like Joshua 1, but the rest of it, like, what is this? Israel takes the land, Israel divides the land. And you and I are going, how in the world does this apply to me today? Like, I want to know God's story, but what in the world? Like, how is understanding uh, the conquering and division of the land useful for us today? You can understand why some people struggle with this book. You can see why some people highlight Joshua 1, be strong and courageous, and then like flip, 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 flip to the end. They're like, when do we get to something exciting? Like, Samson's coming. Like, I know that's going to be exciting. You can see why some people wonder what this book has to do with us. And the answer is a lot. But first, we have to get there by answering a question. How does this book fit within the story of the Bible? How does this 
book fit within the story of the Bible. Let's zoom out from that, uh, the outline of Joshua. Let's zoom out a little bit. What is the context of the story? Well, Genesis 12 was a major turning point in the biblical story. Again, God turns to a pagan idol worshiper and says, you're it. Like, I'm saving the world through you. And listen what he said to Abraham. Go from your country. Abraham, leave everything behind. Like, sell everything. Go uh, from your father's house to the land I will show you. Canaan. He's like, Abraham, you're it. And I want you to leave what you've known. And I want you to go to Canaan. I want you to go to Canaan. And Abraham goes there. There's all these people living there already. In verse 7, God says to Abraham of Genesis 12, to your offspring, I will give this land. So picture Abraham going to this place where all these people live. And he's looking around and God says, one day, this will be yours. One day, you're not going to see it, Abraham. Uh, One day, this is going to be like, remember the nation I'm building? This is going to be where they live. Genesis 15, verse 8. So God appears to him again. By the way, it's interesting how many times God appeared to Abraham. Uh, Like every little while, God would appear to him and just say, Abraham, like, I'm still on it. I'm still working on this plan. Like, Abraham must have been worrying, like, what's going on here? Like, did I dream? So God appears to him again and says, Abraham, again, let me tell you, uh, Genesis 15, 8. To your offspring, I will give this land. Abraham looks around. Like, God's now promised twice. This is the land. This is going to be it where your people come. Then chapter 17 again. Listen to what God says. I will establish my covenant between me and you, uh, your offspring, after you, throughout your generations, an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. And here's what God says then. I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. You get to Joshua, and what Joshua, what the author, we have no idea who wrote Joshua is, but what Joshua is doing is he's sticking a pin in Genesis 12 and 15 and 17, tying a pin and drawing a line all the way to Joshua and saying, God is keeping his promises. You remember all those promises God made like Abraham wandered around this land and God's like this is going to be yours he takes a line and he draws it all the way from these promises that he made to Abraham and in Joshua God is keeping his promises God is to the letter saying just as I promised hundreds of years earlier I'm keeping every single one of my promises to you friends the story of if you back up Joshua is not simply about like conquering land and dividing land and uh, all that stuff. It is about that. But it's really the story of God keeping his promises. Uh, despite the fact, if you think about this, despite the fact that the people didn't deserve to be chosen, despite the fact that Abraham was a, uh, worshipped other gods, despite the fact that, as we're going to see, like the family was dysfunctional, Despite the fact, like, I could go on and on and on. Despite all these things, God kept his promises over and over and over again. So why is this, like, what does this have to do with us? Because God always keeps his promises. If God has made a promise to his people, hundreds of years go by, you're like, and all kinds of reasons why things aren't working out. Joshua's like picking us and shaking us and saying, friends, God always keeps his promises. Against all odds, despite all obstacles, God always keeps his promises and gives his people rest. I want to lift three highlights from the book of Joshua. I was thinking about, um, there's so much in Joshua. I was like, what can I, how can I really, like what would be helpful for us? I, I could go on like, Honestly, this Joshua wants, I want to preach through Joshua, but let me just pick three highlights from Joshua and see if I can just bring these home to us today. Here's three highlights 
uh, from Joshua. Here's the first. God does the heavy lifting in Joshua. What would you think a book named the book of Joshua is about? Anyone? Who, pick, who would have said Joshua, right? Anyone else? I would have picked Joshua, right? It is not about Joshua. It is so not about Joshua. In fact, uh, it's amazing because Moses just died. Joshua is going to come and go very quickly. It is actually not about Joshua. It's, it's interesting how little, I mean, Joshua plays a role, but it's not really a book about Joshua at all. If you thought it was about the Israelites, you'd also be wrong. It's actually a book about God, just like the rest of the Bible, actually. In Joshua, God does the heavy lifting. The emphasis in Joshua, they're going to go into this land and take it. God has promised it. What is going to get them the land? I would have said military strength or military strategy or deceit or, you know, cunning strategy, something like that. How does God give them the land? None of that. God says, just stand back and watch me work. I'm going to, I'm going to do everything for you. I'm going to give you the land. And so take the first city that they face, the city of Jericho. They cross the Jordan River. It's like, this is a first test. Can you picture, like, um, I don't know, like, picture us going, like, we're taking Etobicoke tomorrow. Like, everyone, like, this is going to be good. We're just going to conquer Etobicoke. Like, it's going to be ours. I don't know about you. I wouldn't sleep. Like, I would just be, how is this going to work out? This is going to be, like, I don't, I don't even know if I want Etobicoke. Like, um, I don't know. But uh, picture this. Like, actually picture the tension here. It's one of the oldest cities in the world. It's the first obstacle they face. They're like, this is going to get real here. Like, all of a sudden, if we can't take Jericho, we can't take any of it. Like, Jericho is going to be our home base of operations. It's like, if we don't win here, we can't win anywhere. So what's our strategy? Okay, how are we going to take Jericho here? And God appears to them and says, like, I can picture, like, guys, lean in here. Let me tell you my strategy here. Like, and they're like, what is it going to be? Like, I've given Jericho into your hand, he says. And here's the plan. Oh, by the way, with its king and mighty men of valor, God says, I've given it to you. And by the way, it says, you're, you're, I've given the mighty men of valor. So it's not like a pushover. There's mighty men of valor in the city. And here's God's plan. You're going to march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. You're going to do this for six days. Okay, guys, what's the plan? We're going to march around the city. That's it. Oh, no, there's more. On the seventh day, you're going to march around the city seven times. And then what? Are we going to, like, uh, like everybody's going to take their sword? Is there going to be, like, a big catapult or whatever? No, here's the plan. The priests are going to blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight ahead of them. Can you imagine hearing this? What's our plan? Like, this is a first city. You're going to march. On the last day, you're going to march extra, and then you're going to blow trumpets and shout. And that's going to be how you win this battle. Israel takes a passive role. And God says, this is, guys, this is a plan. I've given you the city. All you need to do is trust me and wait. The plan makes no sense unless God is real. But it's how God operates. What he's doing is right from the start, he's teaching Israel you can't take this land, but I can take it for you. You're not the one who's going to earn this victory. I'm, gonna, I'm teaching how I work. I will give you the victory. You simply, you, you don't work for it. You simply receive it. Near the end of Joshua, God says to his people, and you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the leaders of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. My oh, uh, Old Testament theology prof always added at that point, and the Mosquito Bites, like all these ites, right? Um, all these Amorites, whatever, all of them. And I gave, you in, I gave them into your hand. How did they win? God says, I gave them into your hand. He says, I sent the hornet before you. Uh, pause there. Is this a literal hornet? Uh, it's actually... There's no indication it was an actual literal hornet. 
Uh, the hornet is a figure of speech, I think, for God's like, I, I supernaturally went before you, like I drove them out. I sent like, if you can picture a hornet going in before and buzzing around and driving everybody crazy, God's like, basically, look, I went before you, I prepared, I like, I drove them out for you. Uh, the two kings of the Amorites, it was not by your sword or your bow. I gave you a land on which you have not labored and cities that you have not built and you dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. Friends, how do we get to enjoy God's blessings? I think Joshua gives us a key spiritual principle. We don't earn them. We don't work for them. We simply receive them as a gift from, a gracious gift from God. That is still how God works. How do you get all the blessings that God has promised to us in Jesus? You don't work for them. You simply receive them. In every area of life, we have to work ourselves to the bone to get ahead. And it's exhausting. Do you want to graduate with honors? Prove yourself. Do you want to get a job? You've got to put your best foot forward and show them what you've got. You've got to like, put on the armor. Don't show any weakness. You want to be an entrepreneur? Chances are against you. Hustle. When it comes to God, do you want to be blessed by God? You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to measure up. You don't have to hide your weaknesses. You don't have to weary yourself. You just simply have to come and receive what God is more than willing to give. This is a one part of life where all working does not get you ahead. Working actually will get you farther behind. When it comes to God, uh, there's no work you can do that would get you ahead. And Joshua is teaching us, God has made these amazing promises. You want to know how to get them? Simply come. He gives them free for the asking. You can't buy them. You can't earn them. But you can receive them. He's more than willing to give them to you. I love the words of Isaiah. He says, come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters. He who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Do you get that? You have no money, come. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread and your labor which is, does not satisfy. What he's saying here is, why are you trying to get meaning in life from your job? Why do you think that buying that next thing will give you what you're looking for? Come, like I'll give you what can satisfy that you can't get anywhere else, it's free. Come to me, I'll give it to you. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in rich food. Friends, Joshua teaches us, how does God give his people what they need? Well, they, we just simply receive. We don't earn it. We don't get it. We simply come and uh, receive the gracious gift that we could never earn for ourselves. Simply come to Jesus, and who has done everything for you, and who invites you to simply receive forgiveness and life and hope. Um, I'm not scared to tell you, uh, once in a while I just get simply exhausted with life. Like, it never stops. It never stops. I'm reading a book right now, a used bookshop owner, and uh, I'm like, oh, this is so good. I'm telling Charlene, like, this is so good. It makes me feel better. Because it's like, you know, he gets the bookshop humming. You know, he hires the staff. And then he goes away. And, like, the minute he goes away, like, um, the, inter the charging processor goes down, right? Um, stuff happens all the time. Like, he sells through Amazon. Everything's humming. Amazon's like, you got to fill out these 20 forms if you're going to keep selling for it. Does that not feel like life? Are you not exhausted by life sometimes? And God just comes and says, you don't have to do any of that. You simply need to come, receive. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. There's nothing that's going to glitch with my grace. It's yours. All you have to do is receive it. It's abundant. You can't wreck it. Come, receive, and bask, and, and eat, and drink. Highlight number two in Joshua. And this is, I was going over this before the service, and maybe I'm the only one who needs to hear this tonight, but here's highlight number two from Joshua. I mean, this just hit me tonight. Not only is God, like, just giving you what we can't earn, like it's just a gift, God does the heavy lifting, but number two, God doesn't care for you in general. God cares for the details of your life. God doesn't care for you in general. God cares about the details of your life. 
Joshua 13 to 21 is about dividing the land. And so Joshua 13 to 21 is kind of boring for us because it's like, well, this tribe, and then it's like this cities and this city and this city and this city out of the hill country of this city. And we keep reading these. I mean, this is eight chapters of this tribe gets this thing and this tribe get. And you and I are reading it going, I don't know where this is. I don't know who these people are. I really don't care. Like, who cares what city the, uh, I don't know. Like, who cares? Like, Dan, love you. Sure, you're a great tribe. I just don't get it. I just don't care. We read these chapters and we yawn. These chapters can seem boring to us. But I heard, uh, I actually saw a podcast a while ago that was going through the book of Joshua. And here's what it said. When we get to Joshua 11 to 21, we're tempted to speed read. It's a long list of places and names that you've never heard of. But the original readers, they would have read it slowly with tears in their eyes. The original readers of these chapters, can you imagine it would have been like the Hussey family, like Hussey family, and then like verses on like, this is the inheritance of the Hussey family, the Wu family. And you're like, I know, I know Woody, that's Woody, right? This is for you, Woody, Miriam, Annalise, um, Godfrey and Blessy. Like, they would have not just sped read it, they would have said like, I know these people, like, the, this is us. This is God's particular care for us. What could be better? I was in a church a few years ago, uh, and I went to their members' meetings. I'm not a big fan of congregational meetings. And this one moved me. It's a big church of about 1,000, and every... Um, Every time they have a meeting that with a number of people moving out like that, they have a large membership of the church. And what they did was they, at the end of uh, part of the meeting, they're like, these people are leaving our church, right? They're moving to a different city. Um, they're uh, going to a different church within the community here, a thousand people there. Well, what I would have done is I would have printed out a long list of people, like here's 20 people who are moving. Can I get a motion? Can I get a seconder? Like Woody and Miriam are going here, Harold's going here. Godfrey and Blessy are going here, move seconder, like, let's keep this moving meeting, uh, this meeting moving. You know what they did at, at that night? They took time and put each person up individually. And they said, Harold is so important. Like, everyone see Harold's face here? Like, Harold makes the coffee every week. Um, Harold is, okay, not, not pick on Harold, like, um, Jared, like, Let's spend five minutes talking about Jared. They were inefficient. They named names because what they were saying is, we don't care for people in general. We care for people in particular. We care for everyone. We're not going to be efficient when it comes here. What Joshua is saying here is, friends, does God care about the details of your life? So much. God is not just saying, I gave the people the land, like, I'm going to skip over all the details. God's like, I'm going to name you by name, and each tribe, I'm going to go into detail about what I'm doing for you. All this to say, friends, right now, does God care for your life? God doesn't just say, I care for you in general terms. What is on your mind tonight? God cares about that. In, God cares about, you list the things that are going on in your life, Joshua is teaching us God cares about each of them. He cares about your work. He cares about your financial stress. He cares about that injustice that's been done to you. He cares about the economy that you're worried about in the next few years. He cares about the mortgage that is coming up for renewal. He cares about that place that's too small where you can't afford to move anywhere because you're paying so much in rent. He cares about work that is driving you crazy. He cares about, go through the list. God cares about all of it. He cares about the details of your life. As we read Genesis or Joshua 11 to 21, what we are reminded of is God doesn't care for you in general. God gets into the details with us. He cares about the details of his people. And final, maybe this is the biggest of all of them, the big message of Joshua. Not only does God do the heavy lifting, not only does God care about the details, 
but despite all obstacles, God will keep his promises and give you rest. I mean, think of everything that uh, God's people had, all the obstacles, right? God's like, I'm going to save the world through these people. Okay, God, like, are you sure? Because Abraham and Sarah are old. They can't have a child. They're infertile. Are you sure? Like, God, you're going to build a nation out of this couple that can't even have a baby and are way too old to have a baby. God's like, I got it. And he gives them a child. Okay, they have children. The children end up dysfunctional. Not even a little bit dysfunctional. Like, can we just admit that every family's weird? Anyone move second? Can we disagree? Like, every family's dysfunctional? I'm so glad that Charlene and I have now identified our parents' dysfunctions. Just in time for Josiah to come along and go, like, my parents are whacked. Like, one day he's going to get married and, and his wife's going to say, you come from a weird family. Like, honestly, I don't know what was wrong with your parents, but something clearly was wrong. Like, can we just admit we're all whacked? God makes his family, Abraham and Sarah, he finally gives them a family. They are super whacked. Like, I don't think any of you, your family could be the looniest family here. God works through this family. I mean, pimping their wives, uh, denying that they're married, saying, here, you have her. Like, uh, selling, like, their brother into slavery. Like, you go on, like, it's bad. And you're like, God, are you really going to work through this family? God's like, I got it. I'm going to use even their dysfunction to accomplish my purposes. I've got it. Not a problem. I've got it. Okay, Israel's in captivity to the most powerful nation in the world. It's like the superpower of the world. Israel's there, and they can't get out. And you're like, God, have you got it? Like, is this, is this going to work out? This is like the most powerful nation in the world. God's like, I got it. And Moses comes along, and he kills somebody in anger and has to flee for his life. And it's like, really, this is the guy? Like, are you sure, God? Are you going to use Moses to save us? Look, he's already fled. He's already blown it. God's like, I've got it. I'm keeping my promises. And then they get in the wilderness, and they've seen God move in power. Like, they've seen God save them from the mightiest nation in the world. And what do they do? They grumble, and God judges them. What do they do the next day after God judges them? They grumble about how God judged them. And you're like, God, really? Are you sure you're going to work? Like, is this the people that you're going to work through? God's like, I've got it. These are the people. And now they come to the promised land. And they'd have almost no experience fighting. And they're going to conquer the whole thing, even though it's occupied by these city-states. God's like, I've got it. Every, despite all the obstacles, despite even self-made obstacles, God keeps his promises to Abraham. Friends, will God keep his promises to you? You're like, you don't understand. Like, my life is complicated. Um, I've got this that happened in my past. Let me give you like 10 reasons why God couldn't use me. Let me give you five reasons why I've screwed up my life so badly. God can never work through me. And God looks at you and says, look, my promises, I made them to you. I knew that about you. I've got it. Like, things are under control. I can work. I, I will keep them. My promises are not in danger. I will keep my promises to you. God always keeps his promises, no matter how many obstacles come along. Joshua 21 says this, verses 43 to 45. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their family, their fathers. And they took possession to it and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to the fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them. Hear that. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them. For the Lord had given all all their enemies into their hands. Not one word, not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. Did God have a 99% success rate with his promises? No. God's like, I'm going to nail it. Like, I'm not going to hit for nine. I'm not going to shoot for 99. All, not one single word is going to fail. Hear this over your life as well with all its twists and turns, with all the obstacles, with all your sins. Not one word of the good promises that the Lord has made to you will fail. All will come to pass. Why? Not because you're good, but because God always keeps his promises. He will do the heavy lifting. He will mind the details. 
You can be assured against all odds, despite all obstacles, God keeps his promises and gives his people rest. And what's going on in your life today? You can trust God. Uh, the New Testament says all the promises are yes and amen in Jesus. Jesus has accomplished everything that we need. Our future is secure and nothing can endanger it. He will give you everything that he's promised and more. And so, Father, I thank you for keeping your promise to Abraham. I thank you for the message of Joshua, Lord. Forgive us for sometimes uh, rushing over it, thinking that it's, it's just uh, boring other than chapter one. Thank you that you are faithful despite all the obstacles, despite all the twists and turns. Father, thank you for doing the heavy lifting, not just then, but now. Um, thank you that we don't have to earn what you so freely give. We don't have to earn it. We just need to receive it. Lord, in the rest of the life, we have to exhaust ourselves and try to measure up. With you, we just come and simply receive. Thank you. Thank you that you care for the smallest of the minute details of our life. I thank you that you will keep your promises despite all the obstacles and give your people rest. I thank you most of all that all your promises are yes and amen in Jesus. And because you keep your promises, may we trust you, Lord, with all that we have. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.